Obama says lots of black ops stuff. I think we should stick to Obama. We'll talk about Obama. He needs to go. Welcome back, and we have Harley Schlanger of the LaRouche Foundation. The websites are L-A-R-O-U-C-H-E-P-A-C dot com and LaRouche P-U-B dot com. Harley, um, we have uh, an EIR fact sheet, Western Powers Back, the neo-Nazi coup of Ukraine. Uh, this is pretty nasty. We have the article on Russia made exposes Obama drive to implement ballistic missile defense prov- provocation. There's a couple sides to that. And uh, let's start with Obama. Well, I wish we didn't have to keep talking about Obama. I wish some of our congressmen would develop the spine to act according to the Constitution and and rid us all of this problem, the Obama problem. I think you once said we need an Obamaectomy or something like that. Well, I actually think before we do that, the uh, surgeons that need to do the Obamaectomy need to take a new nutraceutical, it's a geopolitical one, it's called... uh, uh, Cajone Max. Yeah. Uh, so and they need to grow some cojones. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't understand. When I see this, the, the, the dour face of, of Boehner, it's like Boehner's meeting secretly with Obama to make sure Obamacare goes through. Uh, the number of members of the GOP have actually been meeting with, De- with Senate Democrats to actually push through the immigration bill, which is insane because they just need to streamline immigration and reduce the fees, but they don't need to have carte blanche let in millions of people without vetting them to make sure they're not criminals and make sure they learn the Constitution and the language. Well, uh, let, you let me can't give you an example to- of, of this problem at the top. Uh, it's now very well documented in most of the press internationally that outside of Klitschko, who may be punch drunk from fighting too much, the boxer who's supposedly been appointed the head of the Ukrainian opposition, that the other two people who are at his side at all times, one from the Svoboda party and the other from the Ukrainian nationalist party, that their two parties have within them large numbers of unreconstructed World War II Nazis. That the symbols used by the Svoboda party are the same symbols used by the SS and the Nazi party. There's even a group uh, within the Svoboda party, their military wing, which has the initials SS. Uh, Their their great hero is a man named Stepan Bandera, who in the 1940s joined with Hitler's army to exterminate and and brought in his forces to exterminate at least 70,000 Jews, Poles, Russians, and Hungarians. And this year, on January 1st, members of the Svoboda Party who were involved in the demonstrations against the government of Ukraine were marching to honor Stepan Bandera. So here, this is a group that's openly admiring the top Ukrainian Hitler admirer and collaborator from World War II. That's who, when John Kerry says, we're supporting the opposition, that's who we're supporting. When Obama says we're supporting the opposition, he's putting a mustache, a Hitler mustache, on his face. Now, well, here's where you I see mean, the Congress I mean, problem. It's amazing. He's two for one, two for two now. He supports Al Qaeda, who is doing regime change in Syria. Now he's supporting basically neo Nazis. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, pretty exactly. remarkable, now, isn't it? And here's the now. Who else is with him on this? Remember when the Libya operation started? There was an outcry in Congress that the president must go to the Congress under the War Powers Act. Right. That the War Powers Act specifies that if we take any offensive military action, the president has to go to the Congress within 60 days. Now, uh, it also specifies that for this to be legitimate, there has to be an attack on the United States or our immediate interests, which, of course, had not occurred with the Libyan situation. So Obama was about to get brought before the Congress on this. There were people in both parties who were going to bring this. It was John Kerry and John McCain who together strong-armed the opposition to Obama in the Senate and got them to waive the requirements of the War Powers Act. In other words, throw out the Constitution so that Obama could continue to send weapons and bomb Libya until Gaddafi was killed and then continue to support terrorists who were the ones who killed our own ambassador. Now, McCain is there with John Kerry as well in Ukraine. 
McCain, who had his picture taken with an al-Qaeda leader in Syria when he supposedly was there to oppose the Assad regime, had his picture taken with a man who has openly praised Hitler and said that in the new Ukraine there should be no Jews and no Russians. John McCain has appeared in public with his arm around that guy. Now, I have all the respect for McCain for what he went through in a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam, the torture and everything else. He, he's but worn it down he, too much. He's, he's overplayed exactly. it. He, he's, exactly. It's time to acknowledge that it probably made him uh, subject to dementia because his policies on, on these questions, he's allying with the enemies of the United States. Well, he's, he's, also those, inflaming, he's also inflaming the situation with Russia. Well, Russia right now is a, is a, we have a, a, an opportunity to turn the elements within Russia and China toward collaboration with us instead of war. And to be honest with you, neither us nor the planet will survive a future war with the advanced weapons we have, not including the fancy ones that America has that are already centuries ahead of anybody else. But the policy of the globalists, we don't care with PD-60 if 100 million Americans die in a thermonuclear exchange before we even do a counter-strike. So no one's going to make it, okay? And if even uh, the power blackout causes, uh, say, 10% of the nuclear reactors on Earth to go Fukushima, nothing's going to survive right down to bacteria at the bottom of the oceans. I mean, it's going to be really yeah, that's, pretty that's desperate. That's absolutely and, right. And, and we have, have to realize that war is now obsolete. So this idea of uh, proliferating nuclear uh, things with Rosatom of Russia or the idea of you're going to hit the boost phase of nuclear missiles, this just inflames the situation more and guarantees the Russians that they have to throw more money they can't afford because their, their economy is diving uh, to advance more weapon systems to counter what we're putting up. So it, well, it, to me, me, it's, me all, just, it's all very dangerous draw, and stupid. Let me just draw one more connection here. If you're sitting in the Kremlin now and you're seeing that the United States is openly allying with people who were allied with the forces that came into Russia during World War II and killed 20 to 30 million people. What is your response to that? And, you know, people who say Putin is overly sensitive, well, you know, it'd be like the, the United States in, in 1803 being happy to see British troops coming in through Mexico and Florida. I mean, the fact of the matter is, that the Russians know that this is not about d democracy in Ukraine. It's not about uh, European Union democratic policies. It's about the collapsing economy in the West and trying to loot Ukraine, loot Russia, well, it, loot anything it, they can get their hands on. But, but it's not a matter of just looting. Here, here's the thing. The devastation is just a means to the end. The end is actual totally hegemony of a virtual currency that's biometric, and then I call it the authentication world, authentication Earth, Inc., which means you need biometrics to buy and sell. You can be stark naked buy a latte, uh, but if they press Alt-Delete and they destroy your icon in their cyberspace, you are basically a persona non grata. And this is what they want to do to every nation. They don't want centrally controlled economies like Russia and China printing money or even doing bartering, which they've been doing now uh, with other nations in their currency, like Australia and New Zealand, which China has been doing. They don't want the BRICS nations. They want a singular control where a few what we call ultra bankers own everything and everybody else basically can use resources but don't really own anything. That's where it's all going. And so the, the destruction of the economy is only a means to the end. The end is slavery, eugenics, genocide, and I call omnicide, killing a lot of people and a lot of living things to get that end of absolute control. Well, and that is exactly what we're seeing as to why they're, they're not afraid to go to the brink of nuclear war and even launch a nuclear war. Oh, yeah, these people are completely insane. They don't even consider the fact that they themselves make it very, very marginal that they'll even have a, even a sliver of a chance of survival. And a lot of them think that they can go to underground uh, depots and stay there for decades or centuries. They're delusional. This is not the Morlocks of the time machine. Uh, the air intakes with, with, with a nation and a world that's dead basically means there's no oxygen being delivered from the carbon oxygen cycle, and they're going to die in their underground tombs. So war is obsolete. This is hegemony of a globalist conspiracy to bring about the mark of the beast. And that's the facts. Welcome back. And uh, Carly, uh, we 
start to look at this from above, as you say, almost like a helicopter view of the geopolitical landscape, uh, let's look more at what's going on. We see now the, the banking community under Janet Yellen, she's yelling to turn off the tap. And what that means is that the currency in Russia has dropped, I think, almost now 15, 20 percent since January 1. Uh, other countries are raising interest rates like Turkey, Pakistan, uh, South Africa, uh, Brazil, etc. Uh, at the same time, their currencies are, and their credit is contracting, which means we're heading toward a crash this year. And it's all by design. People have to know the devastation that's coming is all by design to force nations like Russia and China to become totally subservient to a global order, a new order of the ages. And I believe the globalists are ready to do it. I think they're going to try to do it before the end of Obama's term because they can use the military power of Obama and the bully pulpit there to actually force the whole world into this new system. Uh, and we've got to remove Obama and put in Glass-Steagall because the banker's primary tool is the is the dialectic of financial chaos and the contraction of credit while they create trillions of dollars of money that just disappears into this mass, vast matrix which has pumped up these economies and the stock market. There's already been a contraction this week, I think of 300 and some points in the stock market. And there's almost certainly going to be a bank holiday this year with a devaluation of the U.S. dollar. Devaluations of other currencies are happening as we speak. So um, what do you see happening this year? Because this is, this is going to get nasty, as they say. Well, you know, you may remember about six months ago, I brought up this question of uh, what happens when they stop the quantitative easing. Because I had been involved in some discussions with some uh, economists who worked with the Federal Reserve who were not the worst people. They were people who were, you know, that was their job. They were trying to figure out how to do something to get the economy back together. And what they were blowing a whistle on was, what do you do when all the money that's been created goes into the banks to either park it back at the Federal Reserve or to just hold on to it to defend their bad assets? And what was clear is that they were stuck in one of these damned if you do, damned if you don't uh, conundrum which is that if they kept printing money, sooner or later it's going to trigger a flood of hyperinflation, which is going to devalue every currency in the world. On the other hand, by stopping it, you cut off the flow of money that's necessary to keep the Ponzi scheme going. Because that's all it is, a Ponzi scheme. And what Bernanke decided toward the end is that the most dangerous of the two options would be to keep printing the money since it hasn't been working anyway. So he said he was going to start tapering. And each time that word comes up, you see the developing sector, the emerging markets quake. Now, why is that the case? Because these countries are countries that have been saddled with a lot of debt in order to get anything. Uh, see, they don't control the terms of trade. In, in free market economies, there's nothing free about it. You have cartels that determine the price of things. And so most of the countries of the world, since we have floating exchange rates, have to go to speculators to get currencies to do their trading. And so since the world is still basically on the dollar, these countries have to have dollars on reserve to back up the bonds, the treasuries they create. Now, once they create a treasury at a certain interest rate, they have to make enough money so they can pay the bond when it comes due, plus the interest. And the right. problem is that since the, bo the bottom has fallen out of most of the markets they have, they're left with high-priced refinancing and no flow of money. Now, as long as there's quantitative easing, they can grab dollars, so they can buy dollars, they can pick yeah, they them up Yeah, they get dollars somewhere. at 0% interest, and it yeah. temporarily keeps them afloat. It's almost like you're in a boat with a bunch of holes in the, in the lifeboat. But you have three or four people that bail fast enough, you're not sinking. Yeah. But all of a sudden, two or three people get out of the boat and decide to start to swim for shore. And now you only have two bailers instead of four, so the boat starts to sink. Well, and then what's happening now is that the Fed is beginning to cut back the money they're putting into quantitative easing, which is basically just buying treasuries and buying toxic paper, which means that there's not as much money available, which also means that the Fed is going to raise interest rates at some point. And so right. now you have a situation where a country like Brazil or South Africa or Indonesia or Russia has a certain amount of bonds coming due 
Or, for right. example, an Italian bank, like Unicredit. They have a certain amount of bonds that are coming due, financial paper that they're going to have to either roll over. And, and the there's person specific dates it, on that, too. So there are yeah. specific endpoint dates that all international financial people know. All I can America be specific on it. that also. Yeah. But, yeah. But it, for example, there are six banks in Europe that have three trillion euros coming due this year. So let's forget right. the countries for a second. Six banks. Where are they going to get a trillion euros? Because the, the European well, resolution the, mechanism doesn't print that much. No, in fact, so, the only country that prints enough credit, there's two countries actually, is the Fed Reserve and China. And China has been printing more credit than even the Fed Reserve by a large margin. But China's been but keeping it in their own country. The Fed has been very generous with our future right, exactly. debt China, by passing they, it out. China's been building infrastructure and buying up access to agricultural land and oil resources and building infrastructure in other countries, so it's a totally different policy. What America is yeah. doing is passing it through transnational corporations to literally flood these countries with money, and now they're almost like a cocaine addict stuck on the, on this this funny money, this well, printed and now money. Here's, here's the problem. As these bills come due, as these what you might call a margin call, as they have to come up with money, what they would traditionally do is just go and borrow more because there was lower interest rates. But now right. they're going to have to borrow it at higher interest rates. So in order to be able to, to get the money, they have to sell their bonds at higher rates. So Turkey, for example, went from 7.5% to 12% interest overnight. Uh, South Africa had a 3% interest rate hike. Uh, Argentina, 3%. And all of these countries are also seeing their currency fall. You mentioned Russia. Their currency fell 10% in the last two weeks. Uh, Turkey's currency fell 20%. Argentina's fell 10% a week each of the last two weeks. South Africa fell 7%. What that means, then, is that other countries that would go in and borrow money from those countries to use to back up their worthless paper now want to get rid of that money because they realize it's no good. There's, they want to sell off those bonds. It's too, it's, it's too late. It's a, it, you know, withdrawal, the effect of withdrawal will cause a cardiac arrest. So well, in other words... And so what's happening is you've got a country like Brazil that owes so much money on their existing bonds, they need to borrow to cover that. But what that means is that whoever's holding their bonds is panicking because they realize that the Brazilian bonds are not going to be, may not be redeemed. So now well, you have it's, bonds it's, being dumped, and that crashes currencies. And that's why what LaRouche has been saying is that in the beginning of this year, we're coming up against a huge bill. You know, it's sort of like the person who went totally crazy and then spent... 20 times your annual income at Neiman Marcus on credit cards for Christmas, and then they get the bill in January. What are they going to do? Eventually, Neiman Marcus is going to take the loss. Wow. Yeah, this is going to get, as they say, this is like a burn victim coming through the door and the smoke is still curling off the dead body, or almost dead body, and the patient is an extremist and unable to communicate. That's how bad the economy is this year. Looking bad. Such an idiot, he'd be entertaining. Welcome uh, back, and of course, uh, these articles um, that you have posted up are pretty significant. Let's touch on some of these too. Russian media exposes Obama's drive to implement ballistic missile defense. Uh, I'll just give my kind of two cents worth on the on the whole issue of war. It should be obvious after Fukushima that even if we have a cybernetic attack on the power back up for nuclear reactors, we're all dead. If we have a nuclear war and even 5% of the nuclear reactors are struck by a nuclear weapon, just like the Bashir reactor in Iran, we're all dead. It's one of those things like, you know, as I said when I was talking to the guys at you know, Strategic Missile Defense Command in White Sands, New Mexico, and they were doing testing off of Vandenberg Air Force Base because they had Q-level security clearance and I was taking care of the employees. I said, you know, you guys have a missile defense system. How long will it be before it actually works and how much money? He said, oh... About 2045 and around 76 to 100 trillion dollars, trillion with a T. And I said, so you've created a black hole, uh, so you can just pour money into it and it goes into the pockets of, of all your transnational corporations or anybody who happens to be on the inside, or it disappears into black op projects like underground cities and God knows what, genetic engineering. 
And he laughed at me because I knew I got it. And the fact is that the war system is just obsolete. The idea that we're going to set up these missile defense systems just provokes Russia to suck money out of their own economy and build more weapons to kill us. And you know, this is what... nobody, nobody can win in a war. I mean, uh, as I said before, Iran has weapons, quote, equivalent in terms of the ability to kill. And all they need is three things, a prayer mat, a spray bottle, and a bad attitude to go out with a lyophilized biological weapon, which I'm sure is already in place here in America. And uh, Americans will drop dead just as easily and quickly from a bioweapon as they will from a nuclear flash at a, or a CME. So it, well, it Al wars Albert obsolete. Einstein, Einstein said at the advent of the nuclear age, either we end war or war will end us. Well, we're and at the I, point now we should, uh, to me, the period on the end of the sentence by the Creator God is Fukushima. God is saying, I have just Fukushima'd you, get it. And uh, war's obsolete. We also have to start collaborating because we have much bigger things than the stupid dialectic of chaos. To so have the king of the of the I could, we used to say this in the middle school, the king of Turd Mountain, and the fact that it's the king rat of this pile of, of of detritus is not the way for a human race to survive the next century. We're not going to make well, it when we have space weather, the sun going crazy, we're heading into an ice age, and the environmental magnetosphere is, is dropping like a rock. Uh, and uh, we're, we're uh, right now the North Pole, for example, is moving, the magnetic pole is moving 160 kilometers per year since 2011-12, 2012-13. Uh, we're uh, starting to see these weather systems moving all over the place. There's no control of the jet stream. We have the polar vortex moving down. I, I don't think people really grasp that the human race, unless we collaborate with things like space weather, near Earth objects, etc., we're not going to make it, are we? It just... Well, let me let me give an example of something you were talking about before on the question of Russia, because this is exactly what happened in 1982-83, when Lyndon LaRouche was brought in by President Ronald Reagan to negotiate with the Soviets on what became known as the SDI. Now, LaRouche right. had been writing going back to the late 1970s about what he called the Sputnik of the 80s, and he right. was saying that if the Russians, if the Soviets develop anti-missile defense systems first, they could use that to blackmail the West uh, by saying that we can launch a strike against you, and if you launch one against us, we can we can knock down at least 90% uh, of the, the missiles. Now, the science has been there for quite a while, and there had been work on both sides doing it. But what Reagan agreed with LaRouche on is that this is the way that you could go from an adversarial relationship to cooperation, initially with the idea that instead of spending billions of dollars a year to keep upgrading weapon systems and, and uh, replacing old weapon systems and developing new weapon systems, you could use it for something else. And that the science, the idea of using new physical principles, to have a capability with pulses, beam weapons, electron beams, and so on, to knock out incoming missiles, that actually, that technology is useful for many, many things in a peaceful economy. And LaRouche essentially sold this idea to people around the president, and Reagan brought him in through Judge William Clark, who was the national security advisor. And LaRouche was meeting with American uh, scientists and engineers and military people, and then was sworn in by the Reagan security team to go to the Russians and present this. Right. Now, the, the Russians, now then Reagan surprised everyone by announcing this on March 23, 1983. The Russians shortly afterwards came out and said, no, they weren't going to do this because the U.S. is ahead of them and they're worried about that. But the real issue is what LaRouche proposed in his discussion to the Russians. What he said is that because they were spending so much money on existing nuclear technologies with the idea that they were going to use those technologies to overwhelm Western Europe, that if they had to also spend it on ballistic missile defense, it would bankrupt them. And LaRouche said, if you accept Reagan's offer, neither country will bankrupt itself, and we can gain from pursuing the common interests of mankind. Exactly. Now, uh, wait, I, I just an addendum that I'll insert here. 
Yeah. The uh, fall of the Soviet Union was directly a result of the rejection of this plan because well, that's, of that's the interference. That's what I was just going to say. In, in other mm-hmm. words, they tried to keep up, and literally they ran out of money, and that's why the Soviet Union crashed. It was yeah, all well, by made design. A forecast in 1983, the Rus said, if you do not, or actually the beginning of 84, if the Russians don't accept Reagan's offer, then the Soviet Union will crash into bankruptcy within five years. It took six years. But he was absolutely right, because these kinds of expenditures are enormous. And they're, the, the problem is, once you're dealing with these kinds of high-energy physics, you can come up with innovations very rapidly so that the existing technologies you're developing are, are soon uh, lost through attrition. And so the costs go up, but because you're preparing to fight a war, you're increasing your expenditures for something you hope you never use, but which eventually bankrupts the country. And we have the same thing, these long wars that we got sucked into by the British in Afghanistan, in Iraq, our our commitment around the world is bankrupting the United States. And as you say, you you can't win a war in the nuclear age. No, in fact, uh, the real point right now is we have a we have formally started like the, you remember the prophecies of Joseph to the to the uh, uh, Pharaoh, and what he told him basically was he had this vision of seven fat and seven lean years. The fat years are over. We're now ending up with world famine, ice age, the disturbance of the ma- of the magnetosphere and the ozone layer. So now we're having massive increase in ultraviolet light that destroys crops. We have the death of the oceans due to Fukushima radiotoxins. We have a population now that's considerably getting weaker, and this year we're going to see multiple airborne plagues. We've got H5N1, H1N1, H7N9, and others on the way, including SARS beta coronavirus. And all of these, by the way, have the uh, markings of being biological weapons, or what I call pre-weapons, which are allowed to then recombine out in the wild so that they can have plausible deniability. What I see happening this year is the combination of a bank holiday, massive uh, hyperinflation, devaluation of currencies and economic chaos and depression. And that depression is by design so that they can force nations like Russia and China to agree to loss of their central control of their economy and total control by a bunch of global banker maniacs who don't care if they use the dialectic of war and killing millions of people to get what they want. They don't care. Well, and what you're seeing, of course, is the same. This is why you see Kerry defending Nazis and al-Qaeda terrorists in Ukraine and Syria. Because they're not interested in democracy. That's the the language they use. But just like Obama is... They forgot the end. It's demonocracy. Well, it's also like Obama is not really interested in ending income inequality. Because if he were, he'd stop bailing out the banks. Yeah, you have a a credit contraction. You have an artificial elevation of the stock market. And you have more Americans now part-timing it. The total number of what we call employment hours has contracted dramatically under him. And since he was president, there's $6.666 trillion additional debt. What a man. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. Welcome back and... uh, I don't think people realize what's going on in Ukraine, uh, and this is an article where Ukraine, all Nazi roads lead to London, and the article after Lavor cites the need to avoid the tragedy of world war in his Munich security speech. Let's touch on these now, because I don't think people realize that we're looking literally at echoes of the elements that brought about World War One and World War Two, especially, that they are literally amping us toward, I call it, lurching forward toward Armageddon. That's what they're doing. Well, I think the the starting point really has to be this question of uh, what what do we gain from what's being done in uh, with the policies towards Ukraine? Now, the argument is that Ukraine is being brought into the uh, the the idea was to bring Ukraine into the European Union. And clearly the president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, decided that the benefits of the European Union membership are not all that great, especially by taking a look at what's happening to Greece and the other countries. We've discussed this. The austerity policies don't work. And no, they're, they're just changing all the, the railway, 
changing all of their uh, weights and measures, the railway lines, all their infrastructure to be compliant with European regulations will cost them so many trillions of dollars, they can't afford it. And, yeah, uh, exactly. and our country is already limping along, the, also the, one of the second largest grain areas on the planet at a time when we're heading to worldwide famine. So the Europeans are eyeing this and saying, we want to have control here. Uh, it's also the main pipeline route for gas and oil coming across from Russia into Europe. And of course, the Russians control most of the oil and gas now coming into Europe are completely uncontracted to Russia. So Russia has a lot of strings in Europe right now. Well, and the the idea that the European Union wants Ukraine uh, as a partner, when what they do to their partners is destroy them. Yeah, uh, the exactly. Ukrainians, if you have friends, Ukrainians, if you have friends like yeah. that, you're, 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 you don't need enemies, right? Yeah, so the Ukrainians basically said, well, what other options are there? They, they looked at the IMF offer. The IMF basically said, we'll give you $3 billion toward about $7 billion they had in payments after you go through structural reform. And then they went to Russia, and Russia said, we'll loan you $15 billion because we need you as a trade partner. You know, Russia does a lot of trade right, but, with Ukraine. But the, but the IMF, typically, I call it, uh, if you've been IMF'd, <laughs> in quotes, uh, you know that the quote, structural changes they want make your country basically your politicians and your people that make laws and rules and regulations about economic expansion, they make them what I call vestigial. And so the, the country will be literally wrecked. You'll be under the control of You'll turn it into bankers. a graveyard. you turn exactly. it into a graveyard. That's, that's what so, they do. So, that's that's yeah, what's so, being done here a little bit slower than what's happened in Greece and Spain, but it's happening in the United States. So to, to make a long story short, what they said in Ukraine is, we reject your proposal. We were given a better offer from Russia. And the European Union was saying, yes, but Russia's a dictatorship, and we're giving oh, you an offer on. of European democracy. <laughs> now, the question for the Ukrainians was, you know, here's something interesting. Let me just throw this out for your listeners to get a sense of this. Yeah. What is it that the Ukraine government did that got them in trouble with the EU? When the demonstrators who were largely Soros-paid and neo-Nazis, came out and started tearing apart buildings. The government went in and policemen disrupted the, the uh, demonstrations. They had pitched battles with the demonstrators. Some of the demonstrators got beaten up. A couple policemen were killed, and then they arrested people. Now, right. the EU said, if you don't change the law and free them, then you're going to have sanctions against you. So the yeah, president I, of Ukraine... Yeah. Let me just finish the point. Yeah. The president of Ukraine changed the law to, to the, the, the no demonstration law. He changed it. They offered amnesty to all the prisoners, and Kerry said that's not enough. Now, let me ask that's... you this. Where is the EU when the Greek government borrows money from the EU to buy rubber bullets and gas to suppress demonstrators against the austerity policies? Right. When they beat people up and jail them in Greece. How about in Turkey? where Erdogan is killing people, he's firing judges who are investigating his corruption, why isn't the EU speaking out about that if they're so interested in democracy? And here's a final point that was made to me by a friend of mine who went to see this movie, Jack Ryan, the other day. The new Jack Ryan movie is all about Russia, Ukrainian pipelines, and Europe and the United States turning against Russia. This movie was, had to have been written and made two years ago. So obviously, this is something that didn't just happen last October. It's something that's been in the works as an attack on Russia for a long time. Oh, absolutely. And that's why the Russians are paranoid. Well, they, listen, uh, as I say, you're not paranoid if someone actually is trying to hurt or kill you. That's right. They're not paranoid. Paranoid is a delusional state where you, the reality is and there's no problem at all. But this isn't paranoia. And the Chinese, yeah. too, should know that they've been had. Even the transfer of space technology, like the, the, this little toy that was put on the moon. If you look at the, at the space helmets and all the equipment that the Chinese have, it's right out of the Library of Congress in the 1960s U.S. space program. But they, they bait them into, this, into, quote, advancing their navy and so on. It's not even part of the Chinese culture to be invasive to the surrounding countries. But because of internal collapse and because of external pressures by these bankers, they're trying to force the Chinese to be aggressive, like the Western powers, and start trying to invade their neighbors and take over territory. 
And the Chinese, culturally, they don't want to do that. And, well, see, this uh, is a parallel to World War One because World War One did not start because uh, Serbian terrorists assassinated the Austro-Hungarian Archduke. It started because the British were threatened by motion in continental Europe between France and Germany to form industrial and economic alliances with Russia, which would have threatened British control of the, of the world through their deep sea uh, navy. And so they put in motion, going back to 1890, measures that ultimately broke France from an alliance with Germany and Russia from an alliance with Germany to set the preconditions for World War I. Well, what is it that killed off the Tsar and Tsarina? That's what they killed the Tsar and Tsarina. That's why even uh, what's going on in China now, the last two years, uh, the transnational corporations that are operating as a proxy for the bankers have basically pulled a plug on moving business out of China to Indonesia and India, and the Chinese are freaking out because they now finally think they're going to get adequate wages to have a car and a home, and inflation is going right through the ceiling. Half the loans in China now are shark loans, so China is about to blow up, and the West and the bankers are trying to speed the process up by throwing kindling and gasoline on the fire. It's just crazy. Yeah, and so you have a situation where, as uh, the famous historian Barbara Tuckman pointed out in her book, The Guns of August, that miscalculations on all sides about whether there would be war, if there was war, how long it would last, who would win, all these calculations go out the window. And this is what General Dempsey has been saying. You cannot game plan war and have... have things happen as you expect they would even with computers because in wartime you set things in motion that get out of control very quickly and well, that's the why same way our policy was supporting israel using every kind of weapon including long-range bomber tankers and everything else to bunker busters and now saudi arabia and israel which have been collaborating with america for decades are now saying they're going to attack iran which could trigger world war three They've tried to exclude Syria from even being in the, in the Geneva talks with their ally, Iran. And yet, rather than trying to make a deal, because most of the people in Iran, if you talk to people from Tehran, they're under 30 years of age. 80% of the population is under 30. And they just want to do business, buy CDs and buy jeans and have a normal life. They don't want to be under the damn mullahs. In fact, we're the best friend of the mullahs because if we didn't aggravate them, the mullahs would probably have no power in Iran. And this is the real issue. We go into every country like Syria and we create a dialectic of chaos. We support Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which are criminals, to try to bring in arms and send in criminals. Or they flush all their prisons of mass murderers and say, you go to Iran, we'll pay all your relatives a lot of money when you die and come back. And you go to see Allah and get your 72 versions. And so they take the extreme elements and make it even worse. And then they amplify these the Israelis and put them in such a shaky position. They're twitchy to pull the Samson option and kill every Muslim within 10,000 miles. This is very dangerous policy. That's the why bankers. Obama has to go. Why we've got to get rid of Obama quickly. Yeah, abominectomy is on the schedule. And as I say, we need to send to Boehner and all the other GOP and Democratic politicians that need to collaborate bipartisan to get some uh, cojone max political, nutraceutical, to increase the ability to actually have some cojones. Okay, I'm for that. <laughs> Amazing. What a, what a world, I tell you. You, you, have to, you have to use a little humor because it's so crazy. Thank you, Harley Sch Schlanger and uh, LaRouche Foundation, LaRouchePAC.com, LaRouchePUB.com. If you want to call and get more information, call 800-922-2907, 800-922-2907. Hour 2 coming up, Hour 3, Mark Biltz and the Blood Moon Tetrads. You'll be amazed what we're going to talk about today in Hour 3.